Awesome. All right. There seems to be a silence sweeping over the room <laughs> with expectation. Uh, welcome, 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 everyone to the San Francisco Dharma Collective. You braved the rain. You didn't melt. It's amazing. I I know I'm a um, was born and raised here in San Francisco, and I always feel like compared to our friends in different parts of the world, we have it so easy, but it's cold and raining. <laughs> so I'm very grateful you made it out of here when you could be home and cozy somewhere else. And yeah, nice to see familiar faces and new faces and just want to really give a huge welcome for folks and being here. The San Francisco Dharma Collective is an entirely volunteer run center which means that um, there is no particular lineage or teacher that is dominant. It's really about the Sangha. It's really about the community. So um, I know it is maybe a little awkward, but just kind of look around. You know, you're trying to kind of sneak a peek at everyone anyway and just look around. Everybody here, friends online. Like this center is really about just getting to come together and be in spiritual friendship, Kalyana Mitra. And so the way that we hold space here is we often follow a text and it has been 12 months we've been following this text. Tonight, it will be the last night. It's If it's your first night, perfect timing. <laughs> No problem. No problem. Um, this is a book that it really tracks the historical life of the Buddha. So it's made up of a lot of ancient suttas. It's compiled by the beautiful teacher Thich Nhat Hanh, who many of you know. And yeah, I, I was I was getting a little misty kind of looking back. I've read this book cover to cover at least four times, but reading it together has just been so awesome uh, to really make the life of the Buddha feels so real, right? Like he and his amazing insights and understanding and teaching that feels, you know, unbelievable. But then the everyday stuff he deals with, like his dad who, you know, pressures him to come home and <laughs> right. His all the fights that go on in his Sangha and the jealousy and the difficulties that are all around him just really makes it feel so alive. Um, one thing I, I was really appreciating, like the primary kind of threads in this book throughout. And one is kind of the revolutionary nature of the path of the Dharma today, but especially when it was um, first making its way through a very uh, hierarchical monarch, actually monarch approach to society in the world. And with the Dharma, every single being was accepted well, who was a man at least the first 15 years, let's be real. Um, but every being was accepted and the Dharma made everybody equal. And part of Buddha's whole realization was when he was able to see everybody and see the nature of reality. He recognized that within any single thing is every single thing. And that any of the systems of oppression and hierarchy were a delusion and were against the Dharma. I just love how that thread is throughout this book. And the other thread that I know Thich Nhat Hanh, I mean, Thich Nhat Hanh, he, you know, he was really the one who coined the term interbeing, right? Really made this idea that we all are of each other. We need each other. We are for each other. But Thich Nhat Hanh was also so committed to having people cultivate a relationship with the natural world and feel connected to the more than human world not just, you know, the human species, but actually all of the natural world. And we really see throughout this story, you know, the Buddha, of course, is awakened under a tree. Everybody knows that part, but he continues to live under trees for 45 years, right? And all the teachings and um, all the monasteries, they're just always existing inside these huge groves of trees in the natural world. And yeah, just really appreciate those aspects amid the many wonderful stories. And tonight we'll start off with a practice and there is like two kind of final stories that I'll share. And again, for folks who haven't been here, 
it is a little bit like Buddhist story time, but it's kind of nice. It's cozy. It's rainy out. I like that never ending story vibe, you know, you got the blanket and peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And the stories are just so uplifting where you really get to understand the teachings, not as doctrine, but as lived experience. Um, so that's what we're going to get into. And the Dharma Collective here, you know, some of it's, again, because I see new faces and want to emphasize some of our primary values. It, in order for us to exist in a spiritual community, every time that we gather together, we have to engage in a set of agreements and care for one another. So the practice of being here is not just sitting with our eyes closed. That's not the only part of the meditation. The practice is really how can we engage in the least harmful way with ourselves and others? So that includes, you know, when you are thinking or ideas are coming up or you're reflecting on what is said by me or someone else in the room, how kind can you be actually when you're listening? How kind can you be when if you decide to share when you're speaking? Like just really kind, not only in terms of, okay, I'm going to speak and I'm going to enjoy what I'm going to say and not feel regret or self-criticism, but also kind in being aware and thinking of how will this land in a room of people who, you know, will never gather again in this way. So just being really considerate and caring with one another in our sangha that is constellating here tonight. And then the hardest part, right, is... Actually, how can we be the most non-harming and caring in our mind, right? When the thoughts arise in our practice, because they're going to, the planning, the comparing, the judging, can we really engage with that curiosity and kindness as opposed to this sucks, I suck, <laughs> when is the bell going to ring, right? I mean, it's okay to have those feelings, but can you be kind with them? Um, and of course, I'll remind us during the practice, but that is really the kind of core of our agreements here, how we can show up in a way that is um, supportive for everybody in here and supportive for reflecting and sharing. So folks into that compassionate listening, compassionate speaking, compassion in your own minds. Yeah, good. Sweet. All right. Friends online too. Okay, good. Wonderful. All right. So we'll practice about 20, 25 minutes. So please find a posture that can give you a sense of uprightness and ease, but that doesn't make you feel, you know, kind of too bound up or too tight. There's plenty of room on the floor and zafus if folks would prefer to sit cross-legged on the floor. And even before we formally begin practice, <clears throat> start engaging this capacity for noticing and knowing. Noticing the sounds, the sensations, and yet just knowing them from within the body, not needing to elaborate and think, what is that sound or what is this feeling? Just knowing it. Giving ourselves a moment to really find the, the beautiful alignment that posture can bring for our body. When we sit in a posture of meditation, we we're establishing it's the very territory of practice, establishing the body, the heart, and the mind. Mm, the traditional pointing out instructions invite us to have a very upright spine but not rigid, 
like a supple feeling of uprightness through the spine, like the long stalk of a lily. And having the head feel that it's resting quite evenly on top of the neck, neither too far back nor too far forward. Find just the slightest upward lift of the heart and the chest as though the heart were facing upwards towards the sky. And softening through the face and the chest and the belly. Mm -hmm. And finding a place for the hands to feel at ease so that the shoulder and neck doesn't feel strained in any way. That could be hands down in the grounding position on top of the thighs or the knees or folded in the lap. When I ring the bell for us to begin, just take another moment to fully settle into the body and feel and find the sense of being in a posture of integrity. And as we ease into the practice, giving ourselves this opportunity to consider what we might be able to just let go of for the next 20 or 30 minutes. Really directly and explicitly recognizing that right now in this moment, together, this is all we need. Whatever has already happened is in the past and whatever comes next is not yet here. So let's give ourselves this beautiful opportunity to inhabit the full presence of these moments. We can really catalyze that sense of letting go with the breath. So lengthening the next inhale, 
and then allowing an exhale through the open mouth. And just twice more, inhaling with a lengthened breath. And then release, let go, let be. And one more time together, inhaling. And release. to help steady the mind and the heart and the body. We can begin by feeling the sense of stillness in the body, connecting with that quality of stillness. Not only are we physically not going anywhere at this moment, we are also not intending to be anywhere else. So finding that stillness of full presence throughout the body. When thoughts, memories, images, planning arises, just rejoice in noticing that the mind has been captured and carried away. And gently relax, release whatever has captured your attention and just return. Feeling, noticing, knowing the sense of stillness in the body. Connecting to the quality of stillness doesn't mean the absence of sensation and movement. Of course, the body is so alive with energies. You can cultivate that curiosity in the sense of just simply and purely experiencing the body.
to further settle the body. We can start following the breath, really allowing our mind to fully inhabit the breath. So as we breathe in, it's as though we're saturating all of our attention and awareness to that breath as it travels in. And following the breath as it travels out, riding the attention closely. Even one full breath where our attention is riding the breath is a full cycle of meditation. You can really rejoice in that sense of one full breath of attention and awareness. And then coming back every single time with care, with kindness, I'm reconnecting to not only settling the body into stillness, but inviting even a greater aspect of silence by settling the speech, following the breath and releasing all other narration, ideas, And if we're experiencing a sense of dullness or tiredness, can more intently focus on the inhale and the vividness it brings as we inhale. If, on the other hand, our mind is feeling busy and active, we can focus on the exhale, the relaxing and releasing.
and where there is stillness in the body and a relative silence of the speech. What may naturally emerge or blossom is a sense of warmth and openness in the heart and in the mind. And so instead of just narrowly focusing on the breaths, we can have a sense of the spaciousness or vastness of mind. If it just feels like you're getting spaced out or lost and focusing on spaciousness in mind, you can keep your anchor on the breath, it's really noticing the body breathing. But just feel a sense of some spaciousness also, not only the breath, the breath and the spaciousness around what knows there is breath. Feeling the natural interweaving of body, speech, and mind. Settling into what are their true natural states. Silence, stillness, openness, and warmth. And this doesn't have to be a concept, but a felt experience. A bit as though the body is firmly rooted and planted here. As though we can settle a bit the inner dialogue and narration and connect not only to the breath, but the sense of spaciousness all around us, a sense of warmth and openness in the heart, mind. Throughout the day, we may have to bring up some armor or defendedness, but when we settle into the nature the true nature of our body, speech, and mind. It reveals this warmth and openness, this silence, this stillness. Not something we are generating or creating, something we are revealing and seeing.
from this place where maybe the body, heart, and mind feels even a bit more serviceable, available for us, we can connect to our intention for being here. The greater intention, bodhicitta, waking our hearts up for the sake of all beings, doing this work here with everyone, every being, in mind. And then considering the intention that might feel more relevant for us here tonight. What part of bodhicitta is alive for us? Maybe it's community. Maybe it's peace, compassion. And take a moment and Without forcing it, notice what intention may naturally arise. Gently letting the intention just settle around you, almost like a cloak or a shawl. And return attention and awareness to the breath and the body. And taking a moment to turn towards the heart. And without needing to create a story or narrative, just feeling a sense of care and compassion towards the heart. There is abundant suffering in our world in our lives, in the lives of those we love. Enough to allow the heart to feel that little squeeze, or maybe that big squeeze. And again, without needing to get into it as a story or a concept, just feeling the presence of compassion a little pilot light of compassion that is always here in the heart, turning our attention and awareness there and allowing it to fill to become more of a flame. And in a very simple way, just feel and imagine radiating compassion towards beings in the world who really could use the compassion. If the words and phrases of compassion support you, please definitely use them. Otherwise, just have the sense that there is a potential to radiate and care, and sending compassion to maybe places or people in the world where it's most needed.
feeling that exquisite balance between the care of our heart without succumbing to the despair of our heart and letting the care be the energy and motivation to radiate out that care in great waves across the world. And then bringing in our sphere of care a bit closer to home, bringing to mind folks in our life who could really use the compassion and care. As we imagine them, our heart again feels that gentle, tender squeeze, that quivering in care. And using that as the energy to radiate out compassion. Okay. And like feeling the whole body as a body of radiant compassion not just from the heart or the head, from the whole body. And then taking a moment and inviting that compassion to be right here. Knowing our own struggles and challenges and difficulties. And again, without story or elaboration, just feel that sense of care directed right here. Just like every being we are needing of this protection and care and love. And feel the heart radiating with compassion for itself. And then almost as though all at once, breaking down any barrier between the radiating compassion towards ourselves, close others, the world, all beings. And simply feel the simple, unelaborated body and heart of compassion for all beings.
feel or imagine this body of compassion for all beings, just being the natural body. Natural way of being. Allowing the mind, the body, the heart to simply feel at ease and rest in this capacity of radiant compassion. Thank you for your practice. Very sweet to practice with you all. So I have some time for any reflections or questions on that practice. And so for friends who are here in the center, you can bring this mic towards you. And for friends at home, you can raise a little virtual hand. And um, yeah, the questions that you have are likely questions others have. And the reflections are just a generosity and a gift. Uh, to share if there was anything in that practice that stood out for you. Just total smooth sailing. Everybody was asleep. <laughs> Uh, half half uh -huh. yeah yeah any questions on that practice or any reflections Please. i experienced some uh, softness and onion it was just very calm and good wonderful that yeah just a good good place and energy good nice Compassion practice is very challenging for me typically. It feels like a lot of pressure mm. and I find like it's a lot of um, judgy parts of me come up. I'm like, is instructor really practicing compassion right now? <laughs> or is he just telling us to do it? <laughs> yeah, it's really hard. Mm -hmm. um, my body gets extra uncomfortable and I'm like, well, I'm not even comfortable. How can I practice compassion right now? Yeah. Um, so yes, I was working with parts that were blocking as I'm asking like, what is like, what are you feeling? What do you need? Yeah. Um, and trying to apply the self-compassion to them. Wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. And when you say like apply the, is it, um, like noticing the judgment or you know stuff that comes up and then just kind of in that moment being like oh it's okay or like what what's that feel like the the kindness towards whatever's coming 
Yeah. Um, so I, I asked, like, what do you need? Mm-hmm. And then the need was expressed or like the fear was expressed. I can't remember mm-hmm. in the moment now. Mm-hmm. But then I was, you know, just saying, no, we are safe. Or like, no, like we, we can do this. Like, yeah. Um, yeah. Is that does this account? As yeah, precious? that's great. <laughs> yeah. No, definitely. Okay. Yeah. No, and I'm just impressed by the awareness to recognize the blockage or resistance happening right you were like oh yeah this is coming up um and i think that's common any other people here have resistance to compassion practices sometimes hey yeah i know it's funny it's tough too because um i used to have so much resistance to all the immeasurables but now i've like fallen way off the other side and i'm so in that i kind of um I forget a little because first of all, they can feel extremely cheesy, right? They can feel forced, like you're saying, like, oh, I don't, um, I like that idea of questioning the authenticity of the teacher, (laughs) totally. Like, are they just telling me to do that? Um, And it, you know, that's, it was interesting because I, um, when I practice, I don't really use the phrases, you know, the common phrases that we have, the kind of, may you be free from suffering. May, and I, I like those phrases, but that can even, it kind of creates a, a story on top of your compassion, or it can. And what I really love is kind of compassion in the wild, not when we're trying to generate compassion, but the compassion we just naturally feel, whether we're, you know, encountering someone um, that we're passing on the street and they look especially anguished, or we pick up any form of news, right? Mm -hmm. And there is that, and I love the description, like the quivering of the heart, like that's the, like the heart quivers when it meets, you know, suffering and it's so natural. And that's it. And there's an actual embodied feeling of it. And it's it's hard to like conjure and cultivate. I found it easier. You know, I, I liked going to the world because that's what's on my mind in the forefront right now. And, and that's true for many of us that there's so much suffering in the world. And we even struggle. Like I remember your question last week, you know, we struggle even to move towards these qualities or practices for ourselves because we're like um the world hello are we paying attention um and so i I think it can be interesting to start with the outer though usually we start with the inner right and it is i do think it's an interesting inquiry of what do we do these practices for and to really feel that for ourselves like we do them for the sake of all beings. We do them because if we aren't cultivating kindness, compassion, empathetic joy, and equanimity, we are truly of like no use to others. Like those who we live with, those you know who we serve, and then the greater world. And I feel like it gives the practice a bit more like of its rigor. Like, oh, this isn't just about feeling good or something nice, like, this is like my, yeah, like my sword, right? This is my warriorship is to be able to cultivate these qualities because that's what's needed. That's what's needed. Again, for the world in general, this insane world that becoming more insane all the time, but also even like the people we live with, like they need us to cultivate this now. Like they need us to cultivate it like yesterday, <laughs> right? So like really that motivation helps. So thank you for the reflection. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes, Star, go for it. Oh yeah, and then I see you online. Hi, we'll come next. Okay. Um, during the part where we're supposed to be giving compassion to other people. I was just like, nope, um, not doing that. I need it all. I mean, I tried and then I started to feel like a lot of pain and Mm -hmm. like hunger and stomach stuff. And I was like, no, I need it. Yeah. Like, this is all for me. Hmm. Um, <laughs> and then I just did that like the whole time. Uh, but I did think about, actually, I did think about another person who is so like, it's my job to sort of like my, my vocation to like, like help 
people sort of touch into very like difficult things that they've been through and like process those things. And like, I was doing that with someone today and it was probably like the worst thing I could imagine ever experiencing for any human. Mm -hmm. Um, And like she was crying and I was crying and I just keep thinking about her. And so I was thinking about her, Mm -hmm. um, but also just also myself and how like, you know, when you do that, you have to like replenish yourself. We were talking about this earlier. Yeah. And I was like, okay, time to replenish then. Like this is the time to do that. So I'm doing that. So that is where my compassion for others practice is at right now. (laughs) It's mine. It's for me. I love it. Very honest. Whoever gets this. I think just the little podium there. Thank you. Yeah. And I think again, that is, that's pretty skillful means, right? Like knowing, especially when you know, like I deeply need replenishment, um, then to be able to offer that to ourselves and, and to feel it like, again, you know, um, I only like to reference the science when it fulfills my, uh, my, my specific needs, but these practices and like the visualization and imagining it literally is nourishing for the body, heart and mind. So it's not just, this is a a nice moment here. I feel good. It actually does help. It really can at the cellular level, give ourselves a signal like I'm okay. I'm okay. So thank you, Ben. Hi, happy new year. I see your little hand. Hey, Hey, um, I'll, I'll lower my little hand uh, <laughs> so I don't have it up the whole time. Yeah. yeah, thanks. I just wanted to hop on that bandwagon of, uh, well, you mentioned that you don't do the, the, the like phrase practice for, um, uh, for immeasurable so much. And, um, I really um i can say with conviction that the phrase practices do not work for me and i also it was really nice for me i was on a retreat with um with the um aloka vihara nuns um mm-hmm. and aya ananda bodhi would, talked a bunch about how and when, when she worked with people uh who are struggling with the phrase-based practices or who think they have it, but they don't. Um, mm. it, like, like the phrases can make things really intellectual. And, you know, for me personally, specifics of the words chosen matter a lot. Like I think the, may you be happy, may you be well, this kind of thing. I find, I always found that to be, well, I mean, frankly, just the use of the word, the words may you, I was like, this is pretentious. This is like a stock translation of the hortatory subjunctive if we got any uh, Latin class nerds out there. Um, So like, uh, it just, that just, that just stopped me right. Yeah. That just, that just stopped me right in my tracks. So like, um, I usually, I usually don't use pre-made phrases. Sometimes a phrase will spontaneously come to my mind, but the vast majority of the time it's um, uh, not that I'm a master of Brahma Vihara practices, but like, it'll just, uh, a feeling will just come up and the more like I figure out how to cultivate that feeling vast majority of the time it's nonverbal and just there was like a turning yeah. point in my practice when I realized that like oh that's okay and since I'm sensing it it actually is probably true I don't need to shoehorn myself into these phrase-based practices so yeah I don't mm-hmm. know I don't have a surefire formula for for getting myself to uh to feelings of compassion but I recognize them and I appreciate them. And I have like sort of vague, nonverbal, maybe physiological memories of how it's worked in the past. And like, just give myself full permission to say, okay, this is like, this is how it, this is my best way to practice and learn to get more skilled at the practice has been just really cool for me. So I wanted to say that. Thank you for sharing, Ben. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's, um, I think that's really yeah, wonderful again to lean into the knowing of what you have explored and and tried out. And as always, like it's so funny to come and sit with a teacher who, um, you know, is leading from where they are and towards what you know they hope will be of most benefit. And yet, it might not fit like the specific experience of folks in the room. 
I will say though, I was just sitting um, retreat over the new year and total, I, I, I mean, again, like I used to really have a lot of uh, difficulty with the phrases, but like, I'm so all in these days. Like, I just love them. Like may you all over the place. I'm so down. And it was, may you be protected from inner and outer harms. And I hadn't heard that particular phrase. It slayed me. <laughs> like, I just was like, I like collapsed, you know, into just, wow, I could like wish that for myself. I could, it's just so, you know, you just never know. Um, and it is, it's so powerful. Words are so powerful, right? They are these symbolic representations of so much meaning. And we are a meaning making species. I think that's like our, one of our most um, kind of utilized skills of this narrative meaning making of who we are and what we're doing, what we're moving through and, um, yeah. Yeah. And the felt experience in the body of these practices, very powerful, very cool. And and I did, I did have the experience of realizing I was bypassing with the phrases for a while. Like I was just saying them and I wasn't feeling anything. So I think there's, you know, a lot of um, working with and working through. So thanks. I see two other hands online. Can I ask for a little pith? Because I do want to tell some stories, Jason and Claudia. I'll make a real quick. Uh, it's it's oh, also fantastic. a shout out. I, can okay. you hear me? Uh, a shout Should out to you, me? Eve, because I've been sort of phoning it in with the phrases. I love them. I use them all the time. But but that sense of like they're not quite. It's more just like this routine or something. I, uh, an yeah. anchor. I use it a lot for an anchor when I'm drifting. Um, but I also had... Uh, you did on New Year's with the New Year's uh, thing. You went deep into the happiness and the root causes of happiness. Yeah. And that really uh, opened a lot up for me. And then we last week we did, uh, you know, the sort of deeply thinking about the Brahma Viharas. All that is uh, is so great. It's like that. Mm. I'm using all of that now. Is this re It's like, an, you know, the new year of. Of, of depth and it, yeah. it's so cool because it just keeps getting deeper you know it's like each of those words they're just words yeah. and they attach to feelings but then when you start really thinking of the root causes that's the that was the the thing and i'm now i want to really go deep into that that feels like a whole year long i don't know lifelong <laughs> so it. thank you that was great mm. thank you for moving in that direction thank you yeah we all took our intention, some who were here last week, of Rama Viharas every week, all week, but in the naturalistic form. Just how we're like, we're always practicing them anyway, you know? So let's just bring light to the compassion, the joy, um, the kindness, and the equanimity. Oh, thank you, Jason. Hi, Claudia. Hi, Eve. Um, <laughs> I also enjoyed your uh, New Year's Eve uh, meditation. It was wonderful. So thank you. And uh, I just, tonight, I just wanted to um, thank you again for reminding us of, I was having a little bit of a hard time at first uh, concentrating on the breath. But then, yeah. you know, when I was following the whole cycle, I enjoyed it so thoroughly. It was wonderful. And I was just, thinking about when you talk about compassion towards the world but not mm. and and uh you said something about but no no despair because i find myself sometimes mm. like watching the news and then i mean being driven to tears and yeah. part of me could feel uh powerless but then on the other hand like you said cultivating the inner and then trying to do my best in my community the purpose of happiness, right? Of yeah. service, of service, and being kind, kind and compassionate to others. I mean, that's yeah, that's right. That's about the and extent of. I think if I, you're not crying, watching the moves once in a while, like there's something wrong, you know. Yeah. So it is. It's like that edge, right? Of drenched in despair, and then really, like you said. I mean, I love that you're bringing it to like, how can I show up? Like, how can I be um, not lost in my broken heart, but, you know, forced for good? 
So, yeah. yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Story time, unless you. Well, if you, if you, if it's if it's short, no problem. Yes. It's just, I don't know. The kind of access is still us very long. It's probably kind of vibrating, pulsing. But kind of. Do you mind using the mic oh, so sorry. they can hear you? No problem. It's not amplified, but just so folks on. Yes, I was just saying was not feeling stillness, but more vibrating and pulsing. Okay. And my the questions that are engaging my heart are the same as the yeah. last person's. Of it felt so important to me this year to open up i yeah. been very shut down for a long time but yeah. it was like when i saw so much suffering it was like i sh i went into hiding and i shut down again. yeah so i i'm really struggling with that how do you let it all be here and yet not just go back into that overwhelm and yeah. shut down yeah yeah and i think again it is really um Tara's wisdom here of like, you got to actually give it to yourself in order to be available for others, you know, and um, that seems a little bit like, oh, but I'm not attending to others. And yet, it, you know, being able to tolerate and kind of be with our distress is like, that is, that's the, that's the ground floor. So to really feel that as part of the warriorship, and then how can I extend and how can I offer up? Yeah, ongoing, ongoing inquiry. So our last week, y'all, so sweet, this book. Um, so I wanted to share, I'll, I'll share, of course, the story of how the Buddha passes into Nirvana. Um, but there's a really, um, like one of the last kind of couple chapters, it, it kind of highlights just this interesting relationship that the Buddha has with the, the lay population, right? So he has now um, been practicing 45 years since his awakening. He has monasteries throughout India and many different parts of the land. And he's developed and forged pretty deep relationships with many rulers, like many kings and queens and princes and such. And folks who really seek the Buddha's advice on a variety of different um, issues um, domestically and, and otherwise. And one of the stories, one of his kind of dearest friends, who is, I think, only two years younger than him and who he meets even before he's awakened, like as he's wandering through the forest in his kind of five years of before he actually finds the path, looking for different teachers. He encounters this, um, he is dressed up as a monk and a, and a holy person, but hasn't actually woken up yet. And he encounters this young prince, not a king yet, King Bimbisara. And you may remember way back, King Bimbisara already finds the Buddha so much more enlightened than anyone he's ever met, um, just because the Buddha has this dedication towards awakening. And this young prince tries to lure the Buddha to his kingdoms. I'll give you riches and I'll give you your own palace. And, um, you know, just come with me. I, I want a friend I can talk to at a level of kind of spiritual depth, not realizing that the Buddha actually was a prince already. <laughs> he left that behind. Like He doesn't need another palace. He had four back in his country. Um, and he, you know, so graciously thanks this young prince and he comes to find him when the Buddha finds the way, when he, you know, attains awakening, he goes back and seeks out King Bimbisara. And one of the very first centers is built in uh, the palace lands there. And some of you may know Vulture Peak, which is this area where the Buddha spent a lot of time practicing. Sounds like it was a beautiful mountain and kind of this perfect cave for him to practice. And uh, that was in King Bimbisara's uh, land or his, his palace area. And so the Buddha is now 78, so getting, of course, quite um, along in his years, and King Bimbisara also. And uh, there was an interesting kind of story about the king and his wife. Their first son, so Ajasatu is the name of the first son, when the queen was pregnant with, her, with this son, she had this uncontrollable urge to kind of take a knife and take a, you know, make a cut on her husband, the king. 
she resisted this urge, but she had this strong urge. <laughs> and then at some point, like the king, yeah, the king like uh, cuts himself. I don't even know how. He just cuts himself, and she like runs over and sucks the blood. And and the king's like, okay. <laughs> and she's like, I'm so sorry, but there's like this like deep yearning for your blood inside of me, and. Um, they talk to all the court astrologers and realize that the baby inside of her um, is going, it wants to kill his dad. And they recommend that she abort the baby or like kill the baby once it's born. And both the king and queen say like, no, we're going to love this child. But this is how Prince Ajasatu, like even before he's born, right? So they kind of had a little bit of this premonition, which is interesting. And yet, they raised the son, and um, <laughs> and many years later, maybe needless to say, King, um, Prince, so King Bimbasara, close student of the Buddha, deep practitioner, you know, really has like taken a lot of the Buddha's teaching into the way he rules. You know, there's such a beautiful part of how the Buddha describes the way that one should uh, rule the kingdom, um, and it's essentially like the most compassionate way one could imagine ruling any country. It's like making sure everybody is fed and educated and has a choice of work and, you know, cared for. And anyway, his whole political view is quite um, lovely. And the king takes a lot of this to heart. But the prince um, definitely has some some issues. The astrologers were not wrong. And he is so, he's just determined that once he gets the throne, he'll be happy. You know, and that the only thing in the way of his happiness is getting the throne. And so he partners with, uh, you might remember from last week, those who are here, Devadatta, who's the um, cousin of the Buddha, but also... Uh, kind of a great um, betrayer of the Buddha, starts his own Sangha with 500 other bhikkhus. And Devadatta takes up with Prince Ajasatu, of course, match made in heaven. And um, Devadatta suggests that the prince kill his father. And he comes with a sword into the father's chambers and the soldiers at that moment capture the prince and they reveal the sword and show uh, the, show the king. And the king immediately, because he's been doing so much meditation practice, forgives him on the spot and says, why would you ever do that, my son? And he says, well, I want to be king. He's like, you can be king. I'm like, no need for violence whatsoever. And the, the king's advisors, just ask. The king's advisors uh, are really upset. They want him to be, you know, imprisoned they want devadatta to be killed and you know the king just really has this sense of karma like i can't invoke intentional harm like i can only resolve this harm um and so the ajasatu becomes king and promptly puts his dad in on house arrest and prevents anybody from seeing him and so the king, unfortunately, is not only prevented from visitors, he's prevented from food. So he's starving. And his wife goes in to visit him and tries to, like, hide food, and they find the food. And she goes in to see the Buddha. She's able to um, talk with him and tell him what's really going on. And the Buddha has, like, you know, he's so brilliant, I guess, in so many ways. So he comes up with this idea of her making a paste of rice and um, milk and spreading it on her body <laughs> instead of hiding food. And so then the king, it sounds kind of hot. And this, <laughs> to be honest, it's not a great situation, but she's like peeling off this sustenance for him. And um, that works for a couple, for a couple weeks. And then they kind of catch on somehow and um, and the king the king dies. He starves to death, right? And Ajasatu takes the throne and everything he's ever wanted. You know, the king is now gone. I'm the king. And needless to say, he's miserable, like racked with insecurity and uncertainty. And um, there's a he's there in the palace with his wife, his son. 
and um, and his mother. So the woman who was trying to save, obviously, the king and the the prince, the now king, Ajisatu, he is so in love with his own son that he allows the son to have the, the dog at the table, which in that time, whew, at that time, no problem. At that time was a really big deal. Like you can't have the dog at the table. Whereas like, I know some of my other pet friends and I, like we let our pets on the table, which is <laughs> definitely not okay, but we do it anyway, because we love them. So I relate. And the um, king says to his mom, you know, um, it is unpleasant having a dog sitting at the table, isn't it? But what else can I do? And the queen says, you love your son. And so you have allowed him to bring this dog to the table. There's nothing unusual about that. Do you remember how your own father once swallowed pus from your hand because he loved you? Um, Adesatu did not recall the incident and asked his mother to tell him. One day, your finger became red and swollen. A boil formed underneath your fingernail. It caused you so much pain, you cried and fretted all day and all night. Your father was unable to sleep out of concern for you. He lifted you onto his pillow and placed your infected finger in his mouth. He sucked on it to help relieve the pain um, throughout the days and nights. Um, he did not dare remove your finger from his mouth because he thought you would feel more pain. Um, so from this story, you can see how deeply your father loved you. You love your own son. And that is why you've allowed him to bring his dog to the table. And at that moment, the king like loses his shit completely. So the prince was like, my dad loves me so much. And just, you know, and so he's in such great despair and calls upon the, the royal physician, who's actually his older brother or younger brother. I can't remember. And a very close disciple of the Buddha. And he says, you know, the, I can't help you. No physical medicine can help you. You got to talk to the Buddha. Then the prince is like, the Buddha definitely hates me. <laughs> like, <laughs> killed his best friend, right? I'm like in cahoots with the person who betrayed him. And, um, you know, it's, uh, he just says so clearly, like there, that is absolutely, you know, not the case. The Buddha really loves all beings. He doesn't hate anyone. Going to him will be like going to your own father. See him and you will find inner peace. He is not a medical physician, but he's the king of all physicians. Some people call him the medicine king, Buddha. So he goes and um, kind of attends this session and meditation hall uh, gathering of the Buddha. And of course, the Buddha welcomes him in and immediately he says, um, what is it? What are the fruits of meditation? What kinds, what does spiritual life bear that hundreds and even thousands of people abandon their homes to do it? And the Buddha gives just such a beautiful description on the fruits of teaching. Um, many of the things that we've been reading about all these months, but he says, the first fruit is to be liberated from racial, social, and caste prejudice, human dignity is restored with Buddhism. He said, consider this example. A servant caters to his master's whims and commands, sun up to sun down, until he asks himself, as my master and I are both humans, why should I allow myself to be abused? The servant decides to lead his life um, and become a bhikkhu or monk. He pursues a life of diligence and mindfulness. He eats one meal a day, practices walking meditation and sitting meditation, expresses calm dignity in all movements, and he becomes respected and virtuous monk. So it's, yeah, like that was the first fruit. And the second fruit is, you know, so kind of restoring your dignity. And I, I like that idea that in practice, right, it kind of levels all of us, like whether it is about literally the status hierarchically or socially in society or you know it levels you to be able to find whatever dignity but also right like everybody is struggling and suffering and so to come to the teaching can make everybody equal and also kind of venerated in their dedication to cultivating their heart he talks about how when people adhere to the precepts when they're not harming deliberately when they're seeking peace through every action and non-harming, it brings deep peace of mind. He also says that it brings us a freedom from fear, 
when we've let go of everything that we think we need to hold on to, our identity, our possessions, we get to like have that bliss of blamelessness. We lay down at night and we feel totally at ease. And, you know, being in what he calls, you know, the greatest joy is to be in the present moment. And when you start to connect with that, even a little bit, it really gives you a sense of like, yeah, this fruit of practice. And um, yeah, so it's, it's, it's beautiful. And Ajisatu, maybe needless to say, gives up all his, his harmful ways and becomes a lay disciple of the Buddha. Um, and there is, yeah, just being able to, to be of service is what the Buddha is like. So it's so beautiful, right? Like not just to the monks, but to all of these different political movements throughout the country and continuing to give, you know, what are very similar teachings? I've been saying for the last couple months, you know, I think the last half of the Buddha's life is like when you put together the greatest hits albums, you know, and it's like, you're like, yeah, repackaged or maybe remastered or reimagined. And it's the same teachings over and over. And in the last chapters, he keeps on reminding his students and his close students, you don't need me. These are the same teachings over and over. These teachings live in you. Like I'm just here saying them again, <laughs> right? And I'll say them again and again, because that's my calling to do so, like, and my generous heart to do so. But you know these teachings already. And the Buddha, needless to say, at 78, he loses most of the people that he knew and that he loved his his wife who's for those of you who don't know the buddha was married and had a son left in the middle of the night there's a questionable retelling of that story in many ways um Thich Nhat Hanh was very kind to the buddha in that one <laughs> uh, but his his wife and son end up becoming disciples um spending a great deal of time with the buddha they both die actually quite early um, all of his senior um, students, Moggallana, Sariputta, they also pass away. Moggallana is killed by uh, a, a different um, group of practitioners who feel jealous of the Buddha. Um, Moggall like, and then Sariputta goes to be with his mother, who is 100, as she dies and decides that he wants to die before the Buddha and just goes into a sit towards nirvana. And so... Um, Ananda, the attendant, the ever faithful attendant to the Buddha, starts worrying and wondering, you know, like, how does the Buddha, like, the Buddha takes care of everyone. How does he take care of himself? And uh, there's a, when he, when, when the Buddha first discovers that Moggallana has died and his best friend, Sariputta, is still there, he had already walked the entire day, but he goes directly to Sariputta's hut. Uh, when he arrives into the monastery, he had not stopped to rest yet after his travels, but he proceeded to console him. Ananda reflected on how sad the Buddha must feel. How could he avoid feeling heartbroken when two of his closest friends had just died? The Buddha would console Sariputta, but who would console the Buddha? And as if to answer Ananda's hidden thoughts, the Buddha stopped, looked at him, and said, Ananda, everyone commends you for studying hard and possessing a phenomenal memory, but don't think that's enough. It's important to look after the Buddha and the Sangha, but it is not sufficient. Whatever time remains to you, devote your efforts to breaking through birth and death. Learn to look at birth and death as mere illusions, like the star one sees in one's eyes after rubbing them. So it's just this really kind of beautiful um, reminder that he often gives to Ananda and others. Birth and death, though they are in like physical form, undeniable, they are also an illusion, right? Just the idea that we can have a sense of something that is eternal and keeps moving. There's nothing kind of wrong about birth and death as these like difficult opposing factors in the cycle of life and to break through the fear of birth and death to really see that naturalness of it is the liberation and so when the buddha as some of you may know he has this fateful last meal of wild mushrooms 
which feels like it's a little bit of, you know, fear mongering against wild foraging, but <laughs> that is apparently what happened. So this, uh, you know, very sweet, you know, um, student of the Buddha who had this very special elaborate meal he made only for the Buddha. Everybody else had different food, but it happened to be poison mushrooms. And um, so he, the Buddha recognizes that and tells uh, Ananda, please let Kunda, who's the one who prepared the meal, know that this is my most, one of my most precious meals I've ever had. Second only to the meal I had right before awakening. You know, knowing that I'm going towards Nirvana is, you know, the, the best meal I could have. So he lets everybody know, like, I am getting ready to die. Like, there, I will be dead within the next day or two. So they brought him into this forest so he could lay down between these, what are called these saw trees that have these beautiful flowers on them. Um, and even as he is make, making his way towards death, uh, he says, Ananda, look, it's not yet spring, but the trees are covered with blossoms. Do you see the petals falling? Do you see the, the petals falling all over the ground and all over our robes? This forest is truly beautiful. Do you see the western horizon aglow with the setting sun? Do you hear the gentle breeze rustling in the branches? I find all these things lovely and touching. If you want to please me, if you want to express your respect and gratitude to me, there's only one way, and that is living the teaching. And so everyone's getting ready to totally lose their shit, right? Their teacher's leaving, and he's like, it's so beautiful here. Please live the teaching, like see the beauty, like really know the teaching and show me you know. And the Buddha, um, and then, you know, the, it's funny, Ananda's like, don't die here. It's a really small town. And Buddha's like, no problem. <laughs> this is a great, it's a beautiful forest. It's all good. And, um, and it's pretty funny. And then someone, you know, people are hearing that the Buddha's dying and they're starting to come from, from the town. And uh, this ascetic wants further teaching. Like, he's like, oh, can I have a moment with the Buddha? And Ananda's like, uh, he's dying. And the Buddha's like, no, 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 bring him over. And um, Subdana is like, he knelt before the Buddha. And he said, I've heard about all these leaders. And I want to ask you, you know, have, have you truly attained enlightenment? He says, whether or not I have attained enlightenment or others is not necessary to discuss. I will just show you the path by which you can attain enlightenment. And he talked about the Eightfold Path, and he said, wherever the Eightfold Path is truly practiced, you will find people who have attained enlightenment. And in that moment, he felt his heart suddenly opened, this uh, Subdana, filled with great happiness, and essentially on his way towards full liberation. So he got to be the last student of the Buddha um, and became um, ordained as a monk on that last day. And um, the Buddha then, as he is really laying down, he lays on his side, his head is towards the north, beautiful flowers falling, you know, all of the monks, 500 monks around him. And he says, monks, listen to what I have now to say. Dharmas are impermanent. And if there's birth, there is death. Be diligent in your efforts to attain liberation. The Buddha closed his eyes. He had spoken his last words. The earth shook. Saw blossoms fell like rain. Everyone felt their minds and bodies tremble. They knew the Buddha had passed into nirvana. And that's really sweet. In the book, it says, put down your book here and breathe lightly for a few minutes. <laughs> Which we're going to do in just a moment. But I want to share the very last uh, teaching of this book. Some of you may remember in the beginning, we start with the story of this young boy who tends buffaloes, who happens to be at the tree under which the Buddha is meditating as he's attempting to attain enlightenment. And this young boy is like an early narrator and someone who's followed us through the whole story of the Buddha. And he is like reflecting, you know, as he's walking around after the Buddha has died. And he said, he felt as if the Buddha had sown 10,000 precious seeds in the earth of his own heart. He would tend to those seeds carefully and help them grow into strong, healthy trees. People said the Buddha had died, yet he saw the Buddha was more present than ever. 
He was present in his own mind and in body. He was present everywhere, in the tree, in the river, in the grass, in the white clouds, and in the leaves. He saw that everyone around him, the young boys on the river, were themselves the Buddha. He felt a very special relationship to them. In a moment, he would strike up a conversation with these boys. They too can continue the Buddha's work. He understood that the way to continue the Buddha's work was to look at all things with awareness, to take peaceful steps, to smile with compassion as the Buddha had done. The Buddha was the source and everyone else and everything else flowed from that source, like the river. And wherever the rivers flowed, the Buddha would be there. That is our beautiful culmination of this story. So let's just take a moment. And as Thich Nhat Hanh invites us to just reflect in this story of truly just a, a deeply loving, caring being dedicated himself so completely to liberation, not only for himself, but for all beings. And we can consider dedicating whatever benefit, whatever energy we may have experienced tonight that feels positive and supportive. And in placing our hands at our chest, if that's comfortable, and then the symbol of that offering, we do dedicate any benefit and merit of our practice with the outrageous and beautiful hope that all beings could be truly free, feel love and belonging, and be free from inner and outer harms. Thank you. I'm kind of sad. Such a good book. I can always read it again, but it's been very sweet. So thank you all. And um, I know we have a couple announcements just to say that uh, we absolutely need and appreciate your support here at the Dharma Collective. So again, as a volunteer run center, completely exist on the generosity of folks who can come. Uh, we also, I think, are looking for volunteers, I heard. Um, that was a yes. And Zoom hosts and volunteers. Uh, becoming a volunteer here is awesome. It's great community, connect with folks. Um, so that is a great way to get involved. And there are some upcoming teachings. I wanna just make one plug for the January 26, 27. It's a Cultivating Emotional Balance today. It's a modality I've uh, taught for the last, wow, 15 years. And these are really awesome student trainees who have um, completed the teacher training. They'll be focusing on understanding our emotions at a deep level and working with meditation to help us, yeah kind of find a little more space between the stimulus and the response. And um, I am teaching a retreat at Big Bear in April with Ryan Redman. It's April 12th, 13th, 14th. It's a weekend. Registration just opened. Please come. It'll be great. We'll be doing practices that are reflective in terms of also working with emotion, primarily working with anger and sadness, and then contemplative practices, primarily working with compassion and equanimity. Happy to chat with you about that further. 